Uh, good afternoon, everybody. I'm starting a little early because we have just lots of stuff going on. Um, uh, welcome to the final Lenten Luncheon in our series this year. I'm Pastor Jeff Johnson. Um, and assisting today is um, um, our wonderful camera crew from uh, Brockton Cable Access. Hello out there in um, Brockton Cable Access land. Um, the um, pastor's aid um, ministry here at First Lutheran. Um, and um, speaking of ministries and pastor's aid, um, on your uh, tables, there's a survey that looks like this. And um, it was created by the Pastor's Aid Ministry, and it's just a survey of what you liked about the events this Lent. And remember, we're coming back after a two-year hiatus, and so please fill that out. Um, you know, I think it's pretty obvious. Um, what kept you coming to uh, the Friday Lenten Luncheon Series? The food, the speakers, the lunches, and the speakers. Other, I saw my best friend, or you know, um, number two, the second category I would be interested in hearing next year, and this really helps because if you know somebody who would be a great speaker for this event, please let us know. Um, luncheon selections, um, keep them the same as what you had this year, and um, a word on that, a number of the recipes that you saw were created by the um, woman who created this ministry many years ago, Elsa Pearson, and so we honored her. And Elsa left us um, and entered the church triumphant back in December. And we have her recipes and her setup and, and all of that. So a lot of it was honoring Elsa. Or if you'd like a soup and sandwich lunch or something else. And then finally, there's the menus themselves, um, starting with American chop suey and in, ending today with Swedish meatballs and ice cream sundaes. Any other comments or suggestions? If you want to be on our mailing list or our, our constant contact email serve, um, please, um, I can uh, just pass out one of our yellow cards and we could put you on any of that service to do with that. There are little golf pencils on your table to fill out, so please use those. Um, you'll also see a postcard or a flyer advertising a concert that is in two weeks, a little less than two weeks. It's the kickoff concert to support um, our Steinway project. We're saving our 129-year-old Steinway. Um, a very famous musician, David Briggs, will be here to play both the organ and the piano in its current condition, and we invite you to that. All proceeds that evening will go to the restoration of that Steinway. So please come. Um, joining us today is Pastor Joseph, um, Polakop, and um, he is a good friend of Ann Beauregard's, who has also been a great part of this. I'm going to ask him to come up in just a second and talk about um, his experience of being um, a, 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 per a person of Haitian origin here in Brockton and a, being in Christian leadership. So hold on just a minute, Pastor Joseph. Before that, I, I would like to honor the pastor's aid ministry. Um, with a flower and a thank you. Um, so those ladies who helped throughout the season and a lot of prep and certainly the execution of this meal and what they do. So I'm gonna to go to their tables and present um, them flowers because they're in the middle of eating. So with that being said, um, please welcome Pastor Joseph. Good afternoon, everyone. Good afternoon. Building churches in the Haitian community. Okay. Let's get a little bit closer. Okay. Closer to this one. Where, okay. I know. We want you to be very famous. Okay. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you for having me here for your lunch talk and I'm very delighted to be part of it and um, I am going to briefly talk a little bit about um, the Haitian experience 
So um, from here, from like when I was in Haiti as well, when I came to the United States, um, so one of the verse that I really love a lot, it's Matthew chapter 28, verse 19 to 20. I'm not going to preach, don't even know about it. But this is a, a verse that I remember that my pastor, when I was very young, I have to tell you, um, I became a Protestant a, uh, Christians because, you know, in Haiti, we all Catholic, but at the same time, you know, practicing all this other stuff. And my family was one of those practicing voodoo and stuff. At some point, my father decided, you know what? I want to leave all those voodoo stuff. I'm going to become a Christian. So he called a pastor. The pastor came to the house, and they prayed for us, for all of us. And two weeks, he said, you know, I don't need this thing anymore. But thanks God, I had, there was a family that really loved me and decided, you know what? I want to continue to come and pick you up, take you to church every Sunday. At five years old, since then I've been in the church. And I thank God that was happening for me. Um, at, as, at a young age, there were the six um, factors for me that, that start me from my, from my journey to ch uh, church building in Haiti. When I'm talking about church building, um, also it's church missions. Church mission, church building for me. In Haiti, like as a, when I became like around, like let's say eight years old, we had, um, we had to learn Bible verses. The Bible verses we learned, we had to go out uh, the next day to go and start talking about them. So these six things, the first thing is visiting the sick uh, at home, and get to know the families and friends. So at that age, we began every Sunday after church, we had our Sunday school teacher to us out and go and visit friends and visit the family. And we learned that's how we learned to pray. That's how we learned to um, preach. And we talked to them a little bit about God and we pray for them, especially if somebody's sick in the house. We take, it, we take that opportunity to go and talk to the rest of the family, especially those that not going to church. That was something that I learned at a very early age. The, sec the second things that I learned is getting um, to know uh, the general community and people uh, in it and their needs. So I remember at one point, now I became 15, I got baptized, once you get baptized in Haiti in the church, it doesn't matter how old are you, they consider you to be a full member of the church. As a full member of the church, I have to go out now by myself, not only to preach the gospel, but also to visit people and pray with them. I remember visiting this family and this thing is still with me until today. I visited the family when I got there, the husband and her daughter took off. They let me with the wife. The wife was the only one that go to church. The husband never go to church. And the wife had a blanket, covered her legs, and she sat on a chair. And I began to talk to her. And she said, I'm going to sing a song for you. And she sang the song for me. Then we prayed. After we prayed, and I said to her, we haven't seen you in the church for weeks. And she started crying. She said, you know, because I don't have it dress to go to church. And she didn't have a dress to go to church and it was so sad for me, but I couldn't help her. When I went and told my pastor, my pastor did not have the means to get her dress either. So, and my family was not Christians. Nevertheless, I went and explained to my mother, my mother was able to provide a dress. And the next weeks and weeks, she started coming to church and that was very, that was something that I learned that part of being a Christian, it's also to support those people in the community. And the third thing that uh, is the street corners uh, ministers. Uh, so every week, the one thing that also we do is the, in my church, I was participating in a group called La Voix des Anges, which is in English called the Voice of the Angels. And now I became like 15 and, and 16. 
So I was in that group. So the group goes on the street corners every Sunday. So when we get there, we preach, we talk to people that are coming from different places. We tell them about God. And for some reason or another, they are very attracted to children, to young people. They will be coming and sit down, we talk to us. And that's when I was pray for the first person I remember that pray, and that person says, you know, I'm willing to accept Christ as my personal savior. I was between like 15 and 15 and a half. And these things implanted in my heart. Um, the fourth thing is um, visiting the sick in the hospital in Haiti. Every member of the church requires to go to the hospital at least once a month. Because in the hospital, there are people in the hospital, they, they have no food. They have no, pet, no family members. They're there, sometimes they're very hungry. We also have to collect money. We put a little bit of money in their hands and we bring cooked food to them, we bring candies. And that's something that I learned to do very early that's gonna help me as I grow up. And, um, and I, that's something that I used to love to do to do, go to the hospital. I remember um, before I came to the United States at the age of 22, I had my last trip was in a hospital where we, I visited and gave them my offering and I, I came to this country. And the fifth thing was um, Bible studies. Bible studies, it's, it's very important in the Haitian community, especially for young people. The more you implant the Bible early, the better. So our pastors teach us to do Bible study. Myself, at that very, at 16, 17, I had my own Bible study group that I was supposed to do on every Friday. We had uh, young people come in, but what I did with that Bible study, I also started a prayer group. One of the things with the Haitian community, if you really want to attract them, talk to them about prayer. Haitian loves to pray, and they will be coming to you. And I remember my group, not only that I had young people, but that all the adults start coming in. The next thing I realized, we had 100 or more people coming in a weekly basis to come and pray. Um, coming to the United States, and I had to do the exact same thing. When I first come, and my sister who knew that I, what I was doing in Haiti, that I was very busy, she introduced me to her pastor, which is uh, in a church of God in Nyack, New York. When I went there, the pastor said, well, you're very devoted, and I'm hoping that you stay there because when young people come to the United States, they become all kind of things. So, and I hope you're not one of those kids. I said, well, uh, I love the Lord. That's all I can tell you. I don't think that anything can turn me around. And she asked me if I can be responsible for the weekly prayer on Saturday. But it was different from praying in Haiti. On Haiti, you woke up at four o'clock. You start praying and you go from door to door, you knock in, the three of us go, and the next thing you realize that you have a big crowd that we are going to prayer. We start at 4 a.m. But here in the United States, when I realized that I went there at 6 a.m. and knock on the pastor's door, he got so mad. What are you doing here? <laughs> I said, well, I'm responsible for the prayer. I said, well, this is like 10 o'clock, 11 o'clock. I said, well, 10 o'clock, 11 o'clock, there's not, no prayer anymore, it's too late. <laughs> well, she said, you're gonna have to get used to it. She let me in, but people do not show up until 11 o'clock. I start doing it. But one day I had a dream, that's what changed my life in the United States. I dreamed that I was um, meeting a pastor in a Nazarene church never been to a Nazarene church in my life, not in Haiti, not in the United States, but for some reason I saw it says um, Nazarene church. When I asked people where there was a Nazarene church, they told me there was one in the Spring Valley. And I told my pastor, I dream about the Nazarene church. I was meeting with the pastor, he hugged me, and I hugged him, it's like we knew each other. And I said, I wanna go there, he, she said, uh, the wife, pastor's wife said, you're not going to a Nazarene church. We're not the same doctrine. These people are not us. Please, don't even try that. I told you, you're going to backslide eventually. And 
Um, but since I, I was the one who had the dream, I, I took a taxi and dropped me to the, that Nazarene church. And they dropped me to the Nazarene church. When I went there, I f met the pastor, uh, his name Pastor Stephen, and his wife Loen, um, on the step of the church. The pastor said, this is the guy I told you I dream, Loen. And we both dream each other for some reason or another. He came and hugged me as if we knew each other. And I got to the church. My English was so poor, but he decided, you know what, I'm going to teach you English. You are my son from now on. It's like it was a God sent for me, and I had this beautiful white adopted father. I remember that one day I went to, he took me to his sister's house, and so proud to say that, oh, I have a son. The sister said, I didn't know a white man can have a black son. <laughs> but it was so funny. We were together everywhere. Finally, um, I started going. I just said, you know, I'm going to be doing missionary work. He said, how are you going to do it? You don't even speak English. I said, you know what? I'm going to be doing it. And I went and started going to the street corners. The next Sunday, he realized that I brought three people and white people. He said, what are you doing? You bring people here. How did you talk to them? I said, well, I gave them both the brochure. I gave them the the address of the church. And the next week, we had a new person again come in. Then the Haitian, they start filling the church. And he said, oh my God, you seem to have a magic. He said, you, it seemed that you've been called to become a minister. And I said, well, I was doing Sunday school in Haiti, and I was doing all those. He said, well, why don't you start doing Sunday school with the Haitian in the church? And I started that, and within a year, we started the first Haitian church of the Nazarene. And now I turned 23, and finally the church was growing so quickly, they decided to send me to school at Eastern Nazarene College. That's how, from Eastern Nazarene College, God opened all doors. When, while I was there, there was another brother called Jackie Michel, who was about to finish, wanted to start a church, did not have this experience that I had. He said, well, uh, can you come with me? I said, fine, I'll come with you. The first time we went to pray, we had three people who got saved in the United States in Cambridge. So we started the, the Nazarene Church, Haitian Church in Cambridge. And that's where we started praying and the church started growing. And that's how I moved to Waltham. When I moved to Waltham, then I started the Haitian church of the Nazarene in Waltham. That church was in a little hill, mountain. People said, nobody's coming. But God, when he's opened the door for you, as a missionary, as you get to know those people, you're praying with people, it's open all kind of doors. Now, what I do, I don't only go to people's house. I ask them what they need. I met people that just come to the United States as new immigrants. They need somebody to complete their, their paperwork for immigration. That was my job. I love to do that. Not only completed their work, I help them pay for it. I take them to immigration. I take them for the interviews. And that way, they tell each other. Within a year, we already had 26 members in that Nazarene church in the hill, where people thought there was not going to be a church. And God opened doors. He opened doors. He opened doors for me at the Nazarene church there. And I started having all this in immigrant. One day, I remember brought three people to the um, Cambridge and some of the legal services. And the attorney says, you've been bringing those people here all the times. When do you work? I said, well, I work, but I cut my hours because I have to look, help people. He said, you cannot do that without getting paid. He said, you know what? Can you work for me? Can you work for us? I said, well, fine. And they hired me, they give me more money than I ever made. <laughs> <laughs> now, not only I was helping the immigrants complete their papers, taking them to immigration, sending their papers, but I got paid for it. And at the same time, I got a way that I could continue to preach my gospel to those immigrants that come and say, you know what, I have a church, you want to come? I give them a card. Can you come? Within two years, that church was one of the most growing church in Waltham. And it's still, one of the, it's still one of the growing church in Waltham today. I'm not there, 
because I moved to Brockton eventually, but we had two pastors, then I'm glad I was the one who interviewed them and welcomed them to the church. We, I worked with them for 10 years before I left Waltham, and now the church continues, and I thank God for that. And some of those people that I prayed for in the Nileys that just came from Haiti are still full members of that church. Now they are working, they have families, they marry their children, they do everything, and they're supporting the church. This is the great work. Then finally, I had to move to Brockton. I moved to Wendorf. When I moved to Wendorf, the late Pastor Gando called me and asked, would you, would you uh, help me with uh, my church? Because now my church is like we're losing a lot of people and we need some help. I said, yes, I would mind, won't mind doing that. And I went to his church and it started helping and the church started to return to the normal and I invited other people come in. We started creating different community. They didn't have a board, we created a board and the church growing up. Unfortunately, it only lasts for about two years. He, I had to leave the church. When I left the church, I said, okay, let me go back to an English speaking church. I went to Norwood to a church, but I had a Haitian community who loves the work that I was doing. He started calling me back and says, you know what? You are doing the greatest work. Not only are you helping the immigration, you go to court with people, no matter what they need, you're always there for their needs. They need you as a minister. You're a pastor. You, know, you don't want to be a pastor, but who wants you to be a pastor? And that's how we started the church, of the, uh, uh, the Brockton Tabernacle Church, uh, 16 years ago. We, uh, we started at the Seven Days Adventist, on, um, which is on, what the name of that street, which is on Oak Street. That's where we started after two years. Um, this, there was another pastor with us. He decided to take some of the people and left. But we said, okay, we're gonna continue. We continue with few people we had, but with fully people we were able to buy this beautiful church where we are now. And we thanks God, and we had two buildings with the church. We purchased it, and thanks God ever since we've been paying it. The church is growing. Everything has been going okay. But I continue to do the same work that I was doing in Haiti. Continue to go from house to house in our church. We have a house to house prayer which we continue to do on Fridays, because this is a one way of getting people, not only to get people, but to bring people to God, because they love to pray. We continue to do the Bible study. We know these are very important things for people, for, uh, people enjoy to do. I continue to do that. And I continue today to still, although right now I'm not able to see as I used to see now, even, uh, recently, I was diagnosed to be legally blind, but nevertheless, I think what God put in your, mind, in your heart to do, you will always be able to do it. And I continue to help him to go to immigration with people, taking them recently, I we took a van with seven people to, um, to immigration. So to help them file their paper, help them find lawyers, and they still to the people who call me, Pastor Polycarp, we need a lawyer. Would you be able to help me find one? Okay. I would say, of course, I can help you find a lawyer. So we're still doing this work, and I thank God for that. Wonderful. Um, we have some, I have some questions. Does anyone have questions out here? <laughs> Okay, I do. What year did you come to the United States? I came to the United States in 1980. 1980? I graduated from high school in 1980. <laughs> <laughs> so, anyway, well, wonderful. And how long have you been in the ministry in Brockton? What year was that? I came um, to Brockton, actually I came to Brockton in 2000, uh, 2003. That's when I started with Pastor Gondo, but this church that we have, we started it in November 2005. Okay, so almost 20 years, about 20 years. 16 years. 15 years. Um, wonderful. Um, does, um, well, you told us so much. It was delightful. So um, anyway, with that being said, 
I need to let me pray, Pastor. Okay. Thank you. We, uh, let's give Pastor Joseph a hand. Thank you. I forgot to do this, and this is the most important thing that we do. So we need to give thanks to God for um, today's food and um, the many blessings of our lives. So let us pray. Gracious God, thank you for today and the uh, beginnings of spring, all the flowers coming up for the forsythia. Um, I thank you today especially for this wonderful ministry and this Lenten, Lenten Luncheon series and all the hands and hearts that prepared the food, all the great work that is done behind it. I thank you for Pastor Joseph's ministry and um, all the people's lives he, is, he can still touches in Brockton and he, that he will continue to touch. Um, help us begin that journey on Sunday of Holy Week and um, where we will find on Easter Sunday an empty tomb and a risen Christ. All this we ask in your name. Amen. Amen. Um, so uh, they're going around with uh, uh, ice cream Sunday, so please grab one. Um, um, I, I think they're taking orders, so... That's lovely. Did you have something else? Yeah, I just wanted to let them know that also I'm a writer. I have two books here if people want to take a look at them. Are there books? Thank yes, you. that you wrote. <laughs> and many thanks to Ann Beauregard for bringing them to us. Thank you so much. <laughs> yes. yes. How many people are there in Brockton? Approximately right now, I I cannot tell you. Recently, I think somebody said we almost have, um, I don't think it should be all that, but they said 20 to 20,000 or more. It should be more than 20,000, but I don't know. It's something that I have to research. And um, your church is in Nazarene anymore, right? No, I'm Baptist now. Baptist. Yes, we are connected with the Southern Baptist. Yes. And the other thing, I, I, Are most Haitians in Haiti Roman Catholic by birth? Most Haitians in Haiti, yes, we are Roman Catholic by birth. Actually, I had an, an experience with that. When I was supposed to go to school, it was very really hard for me to go to school because um, for some reason or another, they couldn't find, when the priests couldn't find my piece of paper, so, and they thought that I got baptized in the Protestant church. If you got baptized in the Protestant church, it's so hard to really find your best. They would not accept you at school then. Now they can, but before they didn't. But the only reason why I was able to get to school easy is because of my name, Joseph. Because they do put the Joseph in front of your name. <laughs> so the school system is not wrong yeah. It's a public school system? It, it's a public school, but it was connected with the women's Catholic. Everything was supposed to be connected at the time. Not now anymore. But it used to. Yes. And just one other comment, I'm sorry. Okay. I mean, just being with so many Haitian families in Rockland as well, and uh, the culture is just amazing in the sense that people, despite all their hardships in Haiti, yes. and what's still going on there, I mean, they can see they have a sense of hope and cheerfulness that's just I'm sure some are You mean the way they are. So yeah, Haitian, it doesn't matter what happened, because we are a happy group of people. We, no matter what happened, we want to stay happy, and we want to stay, um, to, to, to stay humble, and do what we're supposed to do. It, in fact, it's kind of amazing what is going on in Haiti now. We never thought, Something like that. Kidnapping would ever happen in Haiti, but unfortunately it's happening. <laughs>